Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Uh, so I know that I've been doing a lot of energetic uh, materials type stuff here lately. And there hasn't been a whole lot of syntheses going on on this channel. Um, and, uh, you know, the energetics are definitely something that is for the more advanced uh, amateur chemists to be working with here. And, uh, you know, the reason that I really started this channel in the first place was so that uh, beginning amateurs could, uh, you know, really have some stuff to do, show them, you know, kind of the ropes of what it's like to be an amateur chemist. And so I figured we'd switch gears a little bit here and get back to the basics. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, a neat little uh, electrolytic process. We're going to do some electrochem. And what it's going to be is I'm going to show you how to make potassium hypochlorite and potassium hydroxide by way of a membrane cell electrolysis. Uh, this is a pretty useful technique because you can, you know, both get your potassium hypochlorite and a, a pretty concentrated solution of potassium hydroxide. I mean, you can go uh, as concentrated as you can really get it. It just depends on how long you want to run the cell. Um, and as all of you should well know, potassium hydroxide is a very useful chemical. And potassium hypochlorite, uh, it has its uses too. One of my favorite uses for it is just the straight fact that if you want to make potassium chlorate, after you make the hypochlorite, you can then oxidize that through heat, so just thermolysis, and you can get potassium chlorate straight from that. You don't have to worry about using sodium hypochlorite and then uh, displace it with your um, uh, sodium chloride. Uh, because as you know, that way is very low yielding. And I mean, really the only other way I know of to get potassium chlorate at home is through an electrolytic cell. And for me, that way is a pain in the ass because if you use a carbon electrode, you've got all the slough off that you've got to deal with filtering out later. And that can be a relative pain because it can be pretty fine sometimes. Um, it, or you have to uh, get or make MMO electrodes and by that I mean either like a, a lead dioxide, uh, so like in the amateur case it would probably be like a, a um, carbon or a graphite substrate, um, lead dioxide, anode, and uh, even though those aren't really that hard to make, they're hard to make them well and they're time consuming. And so that's just kind of a pain in the dick to do. And then you've got the only other real option you have is platinum. Uh, because everything will just be destroyed other than the lead dioxide and the platinum that I know of anyhow. So if anybody knows of any other types of, of electrodes that would work that are affordable, uh, please let me know in the comments. Uh, because even the titanium, uh, platinized titanium electrodes are pretty expensive from the ones that I've found. I mean, they're more affordable than just straight platinum. Um, but like the only platinum that I've found that I could afford online is like platinum wire. And it's very thin, and you get, like, centimeters of it, you know. And it's, it would take, like, a whole spool for me to, like, tighten that down into, into something usable as a, a pretty decent size electrode. Um, so, you know, that's something to think about uh, if you want to do this procedure at home. It gives you an easier route to make potassium chlorate than uh, some of the other ones and better yielding. Uh, because, you know, once you heat it up, you've got your potassium chlorate that will crystallize out and then the rest will just be uh, potassium hypochlorite crystals again or potassium chloride depending on uh, what's going to come out. It should be potassium chloride, I guess, um, if there's anything left after that, which yeah, it would be potassium chloride. I'm sorry, not, not hypochlorite. That will be gone. Um, but anyhow, let's get on with the video and I uh, hope uh, you guys enjoy it. So after we have our cell, uh, like electrolytic cell already made up, next thing we need to do is make our brine. And for the brine, for this, we're going to be using potassium chloride. And you can see here, I've got a jar of like potassium chloride crystals. Oh, it's not wanting to show up too well. Let me zoom back out a little bit. There you can kind of see it's it's just free-flowing crystals. You'll see it better when I pour it in. And then 
I have these guys too, which these are just pellets um, for a uh, like water softener. And this is by far the cheapest way to get it. I got like a 25 pound bag of pure potassium chloride pellets for right about uh, 25 bucks. So it's about a dollar a pound. Um, you can also buy it as something called no salt or new salt that you can get at the supermarket for like diabetics that don't want sodium in their food. However, you get like, I think it's something like 12 ounces or so three quarters of a pound for like anywhere between 10 and $15 I've seen it. So much more cost effective to get the big pellets like this. They just take a little bit longer to dissolve. And I actually recommend putting them in a bag and crushing them with a hammer first. But even at that, they're so dense they take a long time to dissolve, and that's just because it's designed that way. Uh, you don't want to have to be replacing your salt and your water softener every day or two because it becomes depleted. This here is actually, um, this is, I forget what this is from, but this was a byproduct of something that I made. So this is just potassium chloride that I made. Um, it, if you get, you see, it's, it's a lot, uh, can you see that? It's a lot bigger chunks than you, like the free flowing powder that you would get like at the store, but this is going to dissolve a lot faster. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a saturated brine. Now it doesn't have to be so saturated that, uh, you, you can do it hot and, and you don't want to saturate it so that it's saturated hot or boiling. You can. It's not going to hurt anything, but it's not necessary. Um, so what I did was, is I heated this uh, water up in the microwave. And so I, just to get it a little bit warm, just to help it dissolve faster. And now I'm just going to dump a bunch of this in. Now, the reason that you don't need it to be completely saturated, like so much to where it's super saturated, i.e. like boiling when you're doing it, is because you can always add more later. It's not that big of a deal. In fact, I'm going to show you uh, a way to where you can have like an automatic uh, replenisher. So let's uh, let this go for a while. And once this is all dissolved, I will come back. And now this, if you didn't see it, I just put in nothing but the sort of powder stuff. I did not use any of the big pellets thus far. So let me go set some other stuff up off camera while... This is going and I shall return. Okay, well, it looks like our solution is pretty saturated and dissolved. However, it is rather cloudy. So, oh, I see it. There's still a haze in there. So, already I goofed a little bit and, uh, I kind of super saturated it, I think. I don't know if you guys can see it or not. See, there's a stir bar there. See all that, that white that kicks up when I turn the stirring on? That is some excess sediment of the uh, potassium chloride. And uh, this is still mm, about uh, between 70 and 80 C, I would say. Uh, to the touch so it's hot enough that it should be dissolving that um, however I am slightly worried that there could be some kind of an impurity in this um, it's just because like I said it's a byproduct of something that I made and I forget what the hell it was so what I'm gonna do is uh, 
while we're moving on to the next part of what's going on here, I'm not going to stir this anymore to try to see if it'll go into solution. What I'm going to do is just give this a quick gravity filtration, get out all that junk that won't dissolve because I'm going to just err on the side of caution and assume that it is an impurity. And then by the time that's done dissolving, we should be done with the next part and any uh, excess a potassium chloride that I'll add to this I won't use the powder I will just use the straight uh, water softener salt that I know is pure potassium chloride so uh, let me get this filtering and then we will uh, move on to the next step so first of all I gotta apologize for the noise I'm talking as loud as I can because I'm doing this outside just because this is where I'm going to run my electrolysis at, just to save room in the lab. And my air conditioner happens to be just right off camera to the left-hand side. So that's what we're hearing. Hopefully it won't affect much. Anyhow, right now I'm going to show you uh, two different ways that I make uh, the membrane cell uh, electrolysis units. And the first one is out of these buckets here. These buckets are just uh, high-density polyethylene buckets. And you see that they're two of the same size buckets. These happen to be almost identical. They're identical and as far as the bucket goes, you can see that one's one brand and one's the other. But what I did was, is I took a uh, step bit and put a hole through here, did the same thing on this side. And whatever size that step bit was, I used one inch here. I took and I secured just with PVC cement a one inch piece of PVC in through that hole. Uh, I just used PVC primer and glue to do it. Uh, if you're wondering why you don't see the primer, it's because I uh, actually had clear primer I used. And then um, what I did to fasten it a little bit more, you can kind of see it on this side better, is right here, that, that white is, right there. What I did was I took uh, a piece of PVC pipe um, uh, like a coupler and I cut little uh, it's about an eighth of an inch or about two millimeter thick pieces of it and sandwich those right around the outside of the pipe to the bucket on both sides and that kind of gives it a little bit more rigidity and durability and it also just kind of gave the glue something more to stick to the only thing um, that I had to do that you shouldn't have to do is right here on the top you can't even probably see it but right along the top inch of this uh, the hole from the way I drilled it was just a little bit off from being perfectly round and so I took some Gorilla Glue and put it in there and it has worked fine um, so that now you can see we've got our two cells here um, the HDPE is definitely recommended either that or uh, polypropylene because then it will withstand pretty much anything you need it to withstand as far as acid or base goes uh, these are nice because I got handles you can carry them around if you want and then there's lids that fit onto them too I have off camera for the membrane what I do is I take a sponge like this and this happens to be a polyurethane sponge but they can be um, cellulose too and since I have a one inch piece of PVC in here I cut just a little bit bigger than a one inch piece of this now you want it to be slightly bigger than the inside diameter of your pipe of course so that it can squish down and make a very tight seal because you don't want the water from one side rushing rapidly to the other side. You really are just trying to make a membrane out of this that's tight enough not to let much water through but loose enough so that ions can get through it. And so you don't want to make it too big either because it, as you know you take a sponge and you squish it down into your hand so it's completely as tight as it will get almost and it won't absorb any water that way because you're closing all of the pores in the sponge so like I said make it just a little bit bigger than the hole and stuff it in there with your finger or whatever I usually use my pinky finger because nothing else will fit and I just try to get it to where it's you know right about halfway at the halfway point and there is your membrane now there is a drawback to this method 
other than there being a little bit time consuming of a fabrication for the cell, which uh, what you're looking at there took me about an hour, hour and a half to do between measuring, cutting, drilling, etc., etc. The main drawback I found is that the membrane, the cellulose or the um, uh, polyurethane sponge, because it's going to be in contact with a hypochlorite, uh, a liquid hypochlorite, I should say even, uh, for extended periods of time, it will periodically deteriorate and disintegrate. And so then you will have to, what, what I usually do when that happens then, is I will take uh, like a rubber cork of some kind, and I will, uh, I'll turn off the electricity first, because this will have current running through it, and I'll plug up one end of it, and then I will just kind of like pull the other stuff out somehow and let it fall into the bottom and then filter it out later and push another piece in and then when I'm ready to start the electricity I pull that, that cork out and that has worked really well for me and the pieces depending on how long you're going to run them they do last for a while like one for me running it and I can't remember how many amps or anything I was running it at or volts it lasted over a week so you know they are fairly robust however what I am going to do today is I'm going to use a different type and I've never tried this type before but I've seen that it works several places on the internet so we're going to use this because it's a lot easier to make more accessible for everybody to make and this literally took me about 10 minutes to make total and so what this is it's got two parts first part is a terracotta flower pot and this is like a four inch one now when you get these initially they're gonna have a hole in the bottom as you can see there that's just a hole straight through for drainage so we have to plug that hole with something what I use to plug that hole is some of this stuff right here this is the uh, moldable epoxy uh, the stuff that I use is this gray stuff here not the blue uh, that is because the gray stuff is more resistant to uh, acids and bases than the blue is. Um, the blue, uh, I forget what, that's like marine epoxy. But this gray stuff actually is pretty super resistant. Um, it, it, believe it or not, I actually cracked the female end of a Liebig condenser, Liebig condenser, whatever, uh, one time and patched it the piece of glass back on with this that kind of wrapped it around the outside and, and sandwiched the piece of glass back in place and this withstood damn near an entire you know whatever it was two three hour distillation of nitric acid and i'm talking rfna not any uh azeotropic or anything this was as potent a nitric acid as i could make it uh it lasted right until the very end and then what happened was is kind of like if this was a crack here in the female part of the condenser where I had this stuff wrapped around it the epoxy where the cracks were and the gas could escape it finally did eat through it but that's hot fuming nitric acid fumes and it didn't break down until damn near the very last part of the distillation so that's how resistant this is but anyhow the way that I actually went about then doing this give me one second so what I did was I got a piece of wax paper here I set that down on the bottom then I put my pot on there like that that's why this has got such a nice perfect flat uh, I, don't, I don't know what you want to call it just flat surface right there that is completely perfectly level with the bottom of the pot with this little ridges right here anyhow so that the pot sits nice and flat doesn't wobble and the wax paper also keeps uh, you from sticking your pot to whatever surface you're working on while also lifting right off when you're done working so I cut off a piece of this stuff you just cut off however much you need with a knife I used about three quarters of an inch long piece you know so you know roughly like where my finger is I'm gonna zip, cut it off mix it together until it's uniform in color if none of you have ever used it before um, and then you have this stuff is really nice because you've got about a 15 minute 10 to 15 minute work time depending on how hot it is out and then once you get it in place it is pretty much set and good to go within five minutes um, literally 
seven minutes after I got this in there um, and let it sit for seven minutes. I tested it with water, filled this container up with water, let it sit there, and it did not leak over a period of 10 minutes. So I assume it, it's good. But the way I put the epoxy in though, and it's kind of a neat trick because it keeps you from getting messy, this stuff will stick to your hands, was I, I pushed it into the hole and then you know flattened it out all the way around the sides as best that I could. And I did get a little bit on my hand doing that part. But then I took another smaller piece of wax paper, stuck it in there, and then through the wax paper, just like this, I tooled it the rest of the way flat and made a nice seal with it. And then you just pull this back out, voila, it's done. So that's half of the cell. The other half is just what I'm using because of the size is a milk jug that I cut down. You see it's just a milk jug. Well, this is distilled water, but same difference, milk jug. And uh, so what you do is you set this right in there and the terracotta itself or the clay, whatever you want to call it, is porous enough that this is supposed to work as your uh, semi-porous membrane or your porous membrane, whatever you want to call it. So in our case, we're going to have water out here, brine in here. Where the brine is, that's going to be our anode and our cathode will be out here in the water, thus leaving us with potassium hydroxide out here and potassium hypochlorite in here. So I hope this works. It should be pretty neat. And like I said, this took, you know, 10 minutes to do. That's it. Boom. You don't have to worry then about any type of uh, synthetic plastic polymer like the polyurethane or even uh, organic polymer like uh, the uh, cellulose degrading. Um, I've heard you can use a piece of cotton too, but then it, cotton um, degrades very rapidly if it's in uh, the presence of aqueous bleach of any kind or aqueous hypochlorite for an extended period of time so that's not the best option anyhow let's go and check and see how our filtration is doing and we will come back out here and get this going okay so here's our filter solution you can see all the cloudiness is gone so uh, that means you know it's saturated but not super saturated and what we're going to do with this is we're going to pour that into here that's where the anode is going to be but first we need to set up the anode what i'm using for electrodes here normally in the past i've used two carbon electrodes and i'm just using these little four inch carbon electrodes uh technically graphite that you get uh, by extracting them from the cells of the six volt lantern batteries that are carbon zinc batteries um, if you're not sure how to obtain those just google in carbon electrodes uh, on youtube there's several videos showing how to do them but if you got a pair of pliers and a hammer they're real easy to get out so i've got a carbon electrode here and i'm going to use this for the anode and the reason I'm using carbon for the anode is because I don't have anything better right now, i.e. more chemically resistant. And the carbon will slough off. So your anode is sacrificial here, as in a lot of electrolyses. Um, however, the carbon, as it sloughs off, or as it's working, period, is not going to react with the hypochlorite at all, giving us any other side products. We're just going to have to filter it out later, which isn't any biggie. What we're looking at here is a piece of roofing rubber that I have that I poked a hole through. And what I do is I always will go like this and poke my electrode, you know, nine tenths of the way through, basically, just like that. So it looks like that. And what this is for is we go like this. That's a little bit too high up. We'll push it down just a little bit. You only need enough sticking out to grab a hold of it with your alligator clip. Make sure it's not quite touching the side. Oh, it doesn't really matter if it is. Well, just the very bottom is touching. That won't hurt anything. And then what I'm gonna do is take one of these clips here and clip that on just like that. Now you can see, if you can see, it's touching just at the very base, but that's not going to hurt anything because it's not going to react with anything there. And so what this does is this kind of uh, helps keep any of the, the splashing stuff coming out of here, which will be um, 
you know, uh, liquid bleach coming up out, essentially, once it starts to work, uh, from coming up and hitting your alligator clip and thus corroding it very fast. Um, you see here, this is one uh, on my cathode that is very rusty. Uh, and that's because I didn't use the protection like that on at one time, but we're gonna do that Let's hook this up Again, this is our anode For our intents and purposes Okay, and now for the cathode this time. I'm gonna try a piece of titanium uh, electrode that I have um, I this shouldn't react with the Oh, you know, this might make titanium hydroxide. I'm thinking about it, and I don't want that. I just want potassium hydroxide. All right, screw it. We're going to use an, another uh, carbon cathode. So what I do is I, I just clip that on same way. Oh, no, my alligator clip just broke. Oh, no. Oh, no, don't do that to me. Okay, there we go. It, you can see the very tip of it bent off, but it's enough that it will, uh, it'll work. It's got a good grip on it. And I don't even worry about um, using any kind of other device to hold that so that it's not getting anything splashed on it because uh, the hydroxide doesn't really splash up out. It's mostly just the um, what's going on here the the um, hypochlorite well you know what screw it I've got another piece of rubber here I'm gonna do it anyhow I just decided executive decision that it's gonna happen and what I use to punch these holes so that they are perfect holes in the rubber what I mean is what I'm talking about uh, was just a, uh, a leather punch like for belt loops Okay, there we go. Now we've got that there. We'll clip our... Actually, I'm going to clip this out a little bit further like that so this one isn't touching. Yeah, it's touch going to touch either way. Well, that won't hurt anything too much. I don't think. Uh, wait a minute, that might heat up a little bit. Uh, here we go. Let's do this. Let's just clip it just like this. There we go. Perfect. All right, so now you can see what's going on. Here's our, our cathodic chamber, and here's our anodic chamber. And so now what we do is we pour our brine into this one, and the other one will have just purified water, distilled water in it. And you just want to fill this up enough to where it's as full as you can get it, but not so full that it's coming up and hitting your electrode, obviously. And I pre-measured this water so that it should be just a slight excess of what we need. Okay, there's that. Let me grab some uh, purified water and I shall return. Okay, here goes in our purified water. And we're going to try to get it to the same level that their brine was. Oh, I'm going to need more than that. Actually, thinking about it, that's all we need. We don't need it to be the same level as the brine. We want equal volumes of water, roughly, and that should be just about equal there. So what I'm going to do is just lower my electrode down further into there, like so. You can see where the water line is now. The water line is right there. So I've got half of that electrode in the water, and I've got almost all of this electrode in the water. I don't like that, so I'm going to finagle this a little bit and get it so that not as much sticks in the water. There we go. We'll just have to go like this. Pull this up out a little bit more. All 
There we go. So, there's, you know, a little bit more on the anode than there is in there, but that's no big deal. It's still going to work. So now all we do is we come down here, turn our power cell on. Uh, it's really hard to read out here, but we're at zero right now, so let's turn on our course amps right now. And now it's telling me to adjust the current, so let's do our, our, our volts, I mean. So I'm going to go up to, it says we're at zero amps, but that's just because I don't think uh, it's permeated the um, bucket yet. Or, I'm sorry, the, um, this thing, the, the jug. So let's just go up to, let's start with 5 volts. Oop. Oh, I'm going to have to use the fine tuning to get it there. There's 4.9. Okay, there's 5. I hope you can read that. And what we should see going on over here now is we should see some kind of bubbling happening and we are not quite seeing it yet. Hmm. Do I not have good enough contact? Well, it must have enough contact because I mean it wouldn't allow the voltage to go through I'm wondering if this clip over here is too rusty and that's why we're not getting any current so oh, it keeps going up to uh, one milliamp so we are getting current through it I think we just need to wait a little bit for uh, this to permeate and let some of the uh, water soak into it and uh, so Let's uh, give this a little bit of wait, and then we'll come back and see how it's doing. Okay, so after some minor adjustments, you can see I put two different leads that are brand new on there to get me better contact, and uh, a little bit more water, and uh, I also turned the uh, juice up to where we are running about 10 and a half volts. I'm going to turn that down to about 10, actually, and we're pushing... Uh, 0 0.028 milliamps. Oh, I'm sorry, 0 0.028 amps. And now we're running good. What I'm trying to do is zoom in here so you guys can see see all the bubbling happening here at our cathode. That's what you want to see. All that little bubbling going on. okay and then that's it okay and the only other thing I want to mention is like I said about the saturation point of the brine eventually this is going to get depleted so if you had excess brine in there or excess um, undissolved solids in there and they were indeed pure salt uh, they will get used up eventually as the solution gets depleted of uh, the salt that was in there However, just for the sake of the video, I wanted it to be nice and clear to show you what it really should look like. Um, and depending on how long you want to run this, uh, as it depletes, what I do is I'll just, like if I'm running this for a week or two, I will throw in um, one of those chunks, uh, these guys here. I'll throw one of those into it, and it just sits on the bottom, and that's all there is to it. Um, as I said, you'll have to check on this periodically because your uh, anode will eventually get eaten up. I've got like a million carbon electrodes in the garage that are, you know, about, about an inch tall that are shaped like a ice pick just because I figured I could grind them up and use the graphite for something. I just don't want to throw them away, but that's all from doing them uh, doing electrolysis with uh, this type of stuff. 
And so then what I'm going to do, the only last thing is, is I'm doing this outside. Even if not, you should do it inside because you will get splattering coming off of uh, your electrodes. And to keep stuff from falling in them, I'm going to put just a piece of saran wrap or some, some type of bag or something loosely over top of this uh, without it touching our electrodes because then it will get hot and the solution will get warm eventually. It's not going to get too warm since I'm only running uh, not even 10 and a half volts and only 0.03 amps. So 30, that three, yeah, so I'm running 30 milliamps. And uh, that's all there is to this. But to conclude this video, uh, I'm going to show you guys a little funny here. Okay, so here's something that should give a lot of you a chuckle. I was taking my first stab. You can see the apparatus is still set up. I need to break it down. Of making, of uh, oxidizing uh, tetrapotassium uh, hexacyanoferrate, or most commonly called potassium ferrocyanide, into potassium ferrocyanide, so tripotassium hexacyanoferrate. And I walked away just for a brief couple of minutes and came back and I was left with this as you can see nice blue color so I ended up making myself some Prussian blue <laughs> yeah and if you can't tell that that is blue then let's go down here and I can do a spot test for you and trust me it's blue guys nice and blue yep so I got Prussian blue instead that was my first attempt at, at trying that little procedure, and I failed miserably, so there's a nice little outtake for you guys to end this video. On that note, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope it was useful. Um, this is I'm going to let this run for like a week myself, so uh, I'm going to come back, um, and I'm going to do a part two of this uh, once the products are made.